Welcome to Mike Morrison Ministries, Church at the Barn, Saturday Night Live. In the name of Jesus, I thank you for opening the eyes of our understanding tonight so that we can see um, more, more of you than we've ever seen before. Looking at the same word, you uh, cause it to be brighter, deeper, larger, and uh, even though your word has already changed us, it just changes us even more to be more like you. Every time we look at it, and we thank you for that change in Jesus' name, amen. I want to read a quote here from a man named George Mueller. How many of you have ever heard of him? He lived in the 1800s um, in uh he uh, started an orphanage because he saw a need and, uh, and he just kept building it and 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 building it. And he got the orphanage up to thousands of kids in, in a lot of buildings. And uh, um, he, I want to read this quote from him. Oh, how very kind and good my Heavenly Father has been to me. I have no aches or pains, no rheumatism, and now in my 93rd year, I can do a day's work at the orphan houses with as much ease and comfort to myself as ever. Um, at 70 years old, he uh, embarked on a missionary trip that took him to 42 countries in 17 years. And uh, he, before he left, of course, he'd been training his whole life for such time as that, I suppose. He uh, was fluent in Latin, Greek, Hebrew, French, German, and English. Um, he said his secret was the recreative power of God's word upon his physical body. Proverbs 4, 20 through 22 is what he stood on every day. And, and we, we've read that before, but let's read it again. Proverbs chapter 4. Nathan read this just a few meetings ago. Proverbs 4, verse 20. My son, attend to my words. Incline thine ear to my sayings. Let them not depart from your, thine eyes. Keep them in the midst of your heart. For they are life unto those that find them in health to all their flesh. How many of you know that uh, the first thing we want to do, the, our, our number one job as Christians once we're born again is to pray, learn how to pray, and lead people to Jesus. But once people get born again, there's, an, there's another step. What happens if that's all people ever find out about is the new birth, how to get to heaven when they die, and they never hear anything else about the Bible? What will happen is very little change in their life. And over a period of time, they'll go right back to doing what they were doing before they were born. It doesn't mean they won't stay born again. It just means they're not going to get any earthly good out of uh, promises of God if they don't know what the promises are. Um, there are, a man counted over 7,300 promises in the Bible from God to me, to you. And uh, I don't know that I've found all 7,000 of them yet. But... Uh, and it took him, it took him uh, over two years, around three years, of doing nothing but 
reading and looking for them to count them. And of course, he went through the Bible more than a few times to be sure he had them all. He's, he was sure he did. Um, isn't it a good God that would promise us so much, so many different ways? If God promised it, he will not take it back. He can't take it back. Once it's promised, it's ours. And if we'll take that promise and believe it, we get the benefit of it. And, and what we've just read here is, we're, if we'll meditate that day and night, what? These promises. Find them. Look at them. Reread them. Reverbalize them. Make them your own. You well, can't do 7,000 of them a day, but you can do some of them every day. And you can every day look for another one. Hallelujah. Well, how many of you know God's no respecter of persons and it looks to me like a good way to live healthy for a long time on this earth is to uh, stay in a word every day. Who else do we know that's lived healthy? Moses lived to his 120th birthday and his eyesight wasn't abated or his hearing. He had, he was, he had everything he needed to lead the children of Israel right up to his 120th birthday. Abraham, uh, read about Abraham, he's 90 years old and, uh, and uh, three people come to see him. He recognized they weren't ordinary people. It was actually, I believe, two angels and Jesus in a, on a visit. Anyway, he ran. When he saw him, he ran out to meet him, 99 years old. He ran out to meet him. And then you read that, just read the account of that. He got to running around all over the place, getting Sarah going, getting everything going, getting everything. 99. Uh, Sarah, at 90 years old, had kings wanting to take her for a wife. Abraham gets scared and he said, she's my sister. <laughs> this is real. It's not a fairy tale and it's not something that God just did for them. If God did anything for anybody, he'll do it for anybody because he's no respecter of persons. And we find out by reading Hebrews chapter 11 why that happened to Abraham and Sarah and Moses Faith. They believe God. When he said something, they didn't just lend mental assent to it. They acted on it. They took him at his word and they believed it so. You know that when Abram, Abram, Bram, A-B-R-A-M, um, went into covenant with God, one of the things God did was change his name from Abram to Abraham. And he put the, the Jehovah, he, God put his name in Abraham's name. And he told him, you'll be the father of many nations. And by faith, we find out from reading the New Testament that Abraham Every time he said his name, what, what's your name? Abraham, father of many nations. What he's saying is, I'm the father of many nations. When he said his name, he's telling whoever needed to know his name that he was the father of many nations. And at that time, he didn't even have a child. He lived by faith. And God put it in the Bible so you and I could learn how to, Im if, if we take the promises of God like Abraham and Moses and um, Mueller, there's other people, uh, E.W. Kenyon. I, I think I was, re I was reading uh, about George Mueller because 
when he got ready to go home, he just left. And E.W. Kenyon did the same thing. He told his daughter that he was going to go home and be with Jesus. And uh, if she had anything to say to him, she should say it. Put on his best clothes, went out in a rocking chair and just rocked himself right out of here. And F.F. Uh, um, F. Bosworth, I didn't know that till today. I was doing some re research. F.F. F. Bosworth did the same thing. Decided it was time he'd run his race and wanted to go home and he just used his faith and left. We haven't been taught very well, church. Everybody's wondering how they're, you know, what they're going to get sick and die with, basically, or uh, how decrepit they're going to have to get before they finally go. And there's a better way. The just shall live by faith. And there's no dying for just person to do because you died already. When you receive Jesus as Lord of your life, you did all the dying you're going to do. The body hasn't expired yet. But you're not a body. You're a born-again child of the king. And when it's time to go home, you should just lay that body down and go. But if you don't know how, and I guess back to the point, if we don't know the promises, how are we going to believe them? And if we don't believe the promise, how are we going to get the miracle from God because he put the miracle in the promise? Amen. God has given us, that's, that's my point, first point. God's, through God's promises, he has given us access to all he has and all he is. Jesus said the Father can do anything. And he also said, all things are possible to he that believeth the Father. Why? Because he gave us enough promises that we can do anything. If it's right, God's got a promise that covers it. And we can take that promise and believe it into this envelope we live in, this natural world that we live in. That's why we're here. Let's look at Second Peter chapter 1. And uh, I want to read verse 3 and 4. According as his divine power hath given unto us all things. Hath is old English for has already. God, through his divine power, what's that? It's the anointing. Through his divine power, he's already given unto us all things that pertain to life and godliness. We've already got all of it. Through the knowledge of him that hath called us to glory and virtue, whereby are given unto us exceeding precious promises, that by these you might be partakers. You could say you can take part. Your part is to take. God's part he already did. He gave it in a promise. Your part is to take the promise, believe it in your heart, say it with your mouth, and expect it to the point where you act like it's so. Amen. If you want to have kids when you're 90 or 100, <laughs> you'll, have to call, you'll have to call that you have to call things that be not as though they were. Now, you understand that God gave that assignment to Abraham. God gave, Jesus came here and he said why I came. He came here to, to uh, die for us, to pay the price for sin and to undo what the devil did. And the only way to do that was to get into hell and come back to life. He came here to do that. 
When he said, take up your cross and follow me, it, it's not necessarily, your cross isn't the same one Jesus had. Nobody has to do that again. He did it, he did it right. What, what is our cross? Where, ask God. You've got one. He's put you here for a purpose. He was here for a purpose. You got born again for a purpose. And the, and the, in the process of finding that purpose, we need to learn the promises and use them as they're needed. How many of you have had a need today? Something come up in your life today and you needed maybe an answer. How am I going to do this? How am I going to pay for this? How am I going to fix this? <laughs> How many of you in the last week have had something that happen that needs to be fixed? So the first thing to do is say, Lord, help me. If you're walking with God every minute, every day, like you should be, you could just say help, because he knows who you're talking to. Help! That's a good prayer. Amen. You know, you can, Father, in the name of Jesus, help! <laughs> I don't know what to do here, but you do. You're inside me and you said you'd reveal anything I need to me and I need to know and I thank you for revealing it to me in Jesus' name. If you're baptized in the Holy Ghost, that's a pretty good time just to pray in tongues. Why? Because you don't know yet. And when you pray in tongues, you pray up things you don't know. And when it comes up out of your spirit, it, go, it renews your mind. Amen. And in a little while... Aha. How many of you have ever had an aha moment? Aha. Aha. God, I got it. It's like a green light come on and you know. That's the voice of God. That's how God talks. It's a... Um, let, let's, uh, let's just... One more time. He has given us his divine power. Through it, all things. We have all things. If you need it, he's given it to you already. There's one, there's one step left for you and I to take, and that's to receive the promise. He's given it a promise we receive the promise by faith, and, it, and it, we receive it, it's invisible. We receive it, mix it with faith, and it manifests in the visible. That's supernatural, but that's, what we're, that's how we're supposed to live. That's how we're supposed to do everything. It, human beings, Christian human beings, uh, start out in life, they start out believe asking Jesus to be Lord of their life, they don't know how to do that. A lot of Christians live their whole life and go to heaven to be with the Lord eventually, and they never did learn how to do that. They never even heard about it. <clears throat> but there's something that I've noticed in teaching faith and, and walking in faith myself. <clears throat> in this atmosphere we live in, we need to continually keep this in front of us and work at this, uh, not as works, but it's not like falling off a rock. You've got to keep this in the forefront of your thinking. It's not natural, it's supernatural. This world is natural, and the, and the enemy of God is running by all kind of natural things you could do to fix your problem right now. And, and people, Christian people, get in the habit of just taking care of that theirself. Well, I got this problem. I know what I'll do. I'll go borrow this. I'll go do this. I'll go do this. Without even, even asking God, without even running it by Him, without saying help one time, you, what the tendency of 
Christian people is to decide what they're going to do and ask God to bless it. How many of you know that's not too bright? The guide that knows everything, including what's going to happen next, you didn't see that one coming until it got there unless God told you about it, and if you never asked him, he didn't tell you about it. How many of you have been surprised by something lately? I think the whole body of Christ could completely taken off guard three or four times in the last four years. And uh, I know there's a few, few prophets after the fact that say they knew that was going to happen, but it's funny that nobody heard about it prior um, That pandemic, I'll tell you what, the first thing that took me by great surprise was when Donald Trump did get reelected. When the voting machines quit working that night for several hours, and then they come back on counting backwards to what they were counting when they went down, I never saw that coming. I don't know anybody that did. I'm sure there's some people that now after the fact say they did, but what my point is, God would have told the whole church about it. I think we thought we had that. I thought, I'll just speak for myself, I thought Trump was a shoe in And uh, I know now that for the rest of my life on this earth, I'm not taking anything for granted. I'm going to keep holding things up before God until they manifest, and I'm not going to let up because uh, we got too much at stake, church. We got to get this mess back on track, and we have the promises it takes to do it. He's already given them to us. And the enemy is trying to get us busy um, getting, doing things with shelves half bare and with supplies all goofed up. And pe people are running around trying to keep life going like it's going. What's that doing? Stealing all kind of time. We got less, we've got less time if we keep living in the natural than we've ever had before. Keeps pulling more Christians away from the supernatural. That's why I read 93 years old and could do all the work he could ever do. How? He didn't say he didn't have time to get with God in the morning before he did anything else. He got with God every morning and he got in the word. He didn't just pray. He got in the word and he looked at the promises. And, and when he prayed, God would show him where to look in the word and God would show him things to come. And he's no respecter of persons. God will show us things that are coming. We're going, we're going to him with things that have happened and we need help. That's good. But while we're at it, take the time to let him show you something that's coming so that you don't have to do everything, to fix everything after it's broke. How many of you would like to catch something before it's that much work? I think that's one of the reasons Jesus' yoke's easy and his burden's light. You can take care of the trouble before it's an absolute wreck. <laughs> All right. <clears throat> let's, let's look then at 2 Corinthians chapter 1. In uh, verse 20. All the promises of God in him are yes, and in him, amen. What's that mean? So be it. Amen. All, all the promises of God. 
7,340-some are in him, yes, so be it, unto the glory of God by us. When you ask God for something he's already promised, his answer is always yes. Always yes. Every time. That's why God always causes us to triumph in Christ because he told us to believe his promises. The, that's how you triumph. He's already given them. They're always yes. They're always so be it. So many times people are asking God for things without really knowing whether there's a promise about it or not. Why it takes time to find a promise. And God said, uh, <clears throat> there's power in two or three witnesses. We ought to find more than one promise. When we have something that we need to have happen and we've prayed, we believe God's, it's a good thing, then we should take the next step and find two or three promises and get them out there on it. And then <clears throat> prayer is putting a demand on the covenant agreement that God made with us. God didn't make that because in thinking it's an inconvenience for him to have to answer your petty little prayer. It's just exactly the opposite. God set it up this way so that we'd come to him with every tiny little thing. He is interested in every tiny little point of your life. And he wants to walk with us continually, every second of every day. And if it's of any interest to us whatsoever, it's of interest to him. And if there's something that we need to know and we're walking with him like that, he can show us things we weren't interested in that we need to get interested in. And he'll do it in such a way that, that we'll say, hmm, I never thought about that before. Have you ever done that? I never thought about that before. Could that be God? Certainly, if it's good. I never thought of that before, and it's bad. That's not God. That's the enemy of God. That's a high thought trying to exalt itself above the knowledge of God. And so what do you do with that? Take it captive. That's not my thought in the name of Jesus. And then say a promise of God and that to get on the right side. All right, um, when, you, when you ask God for what he's already promised, you're, it, the answer is always yes. So be it. And so that word ask throws Christ, English-speaking Christians off. It's, it's, it's a word they're using as a covenant word. And it isn't God please it's, Father, thank you. You promised that. I receive it in the name of Jesus. You're putting a demand on that promise. He promised it, but it, it needs somebody to receive it. It needs somebody to put a demand on it. There's lights in this building, but they won't come on unless somebody puts a demand on those lights. You flip that switch, you put a demand on the electricity and the lights, and they come on. That's exactly what the word ask is, is about in the English language. Ask and it'll be given to you. You've got the promise. You've got two or three of them. Take them and put a demand on them. Hook them up with a circuit so they've got a place to flow to. And then let's look at Galatians chapter 1. Verse 3. 
Grace be unto you and peace from God the Father and from our Lord Jesus Christ, who gave himself for our sins that he might deliver us from this present evil world according to the will of God our Father, to whom be the glory forever and ever. So be it. When you've asked Jesus to be Lord of your life, you have been delivered from this present evil world. You and I aren't trapped by this now unless we get caught up in the way they do things. But if we'll come out of the way the world does things and get over on these promises and the covenant that God's given us, we're above and not beneath. We're the head, not the tail. We're supernaturally empowered. Wherever we go and whatever we're doing, we have, we have something the devil can't handle, and that's the anointing power of God operating through us all of the time. His promises are his word. His word is anointed. Every time we, we reiterate a promise, and when we, when we say it again, Believing in our heart and saying it with our mouth, we put a demand on that supernatural power of God and we're walking in his blessing and uh, it delivers us from this present evil world right, right while we're walking in the middle of it. There's a, a tendency here in the last few years for uh, Christians to be um, looking at how bad things are getting and talking about how bad they're getting and taking steps in the natural so that um, we're a little bit safer in the natural. And what I'm trying, what I believe the Holy Spirit wants me to get across this evening is there's, it's all right to take natural steps, but that's not enough. That's not how you walk uh, in this present evil world without it being able to touch you. You walk in this present evil world by faith in the promises of the covenant of God. First, take the natural steps that, that makes sense and that you that God's um, putting an unction in your heart I know people who uh, who I'm gonna, I want to say I, I'm not I, I don't want to uh, say that everybody's wrong for taking a flu shot I don't believe that's true I believe everybody's an individual and everybody needs to hear God before you do something like that, especially with an experimental flu shot that nobody knows anything about. And uh, just because the world says it's safe doesn't mean it's at all safe because the killer that come to kill, steal, and destroy is the God of this world and this world system. You need something better than that. What do you need before you stick yourself with a needle? An unction. God lives on the inside of you. He knows whether your body can stand that or not. You should say, help! Should I or should I not? And then listen, you're going to get a hmm or a uh, right here. And if you get a, uh, then it doesn't matter if you get fired. It doesn't matter who likes it, who doesn't like it, who quits being your friend. If you get a, uh, you better get away from that needle. And if you get a, hmm, then you should go ahead and take that shot. There shouldn't be anybody put any guilt or condemnation on you whatsoever. It's between you and, does this make sense? This is, a t this is a good example, I think. And, and what I want to get across is every decision you and I make in life should be ran by the one who knows everything before we make that decision. Even the quick ones. Decision has to be made right now. You usually know what's right and wrong anyway. Well, 
do wrong just because it looks easy. You do the right thing because it's right. Do it right. If it costs you everything, do the right thing and do it right. Why? Because the one that's got everything is on your side and you won't lose. If you compromise to keep something, you're going to lose what you compromise to keep every time. The devil will steal it because your compromise gives him the place to do so and he is a thief and you give him place, he'll take it. Every time. And then you'll hear the, uh, some believers say, why'd God let that happen to me? Yeah. It's a very common question. And it's usually got a real quick, plain answer. If you just say, Lord, what did I do without checking with you, in with you first? Because something went wrong. And you're never wrong. You always caused me to triumph. There's only one way it could have went wrong. I zigged when I should have zigged. Pointed out to me, I plead the blood over that. I, I, I ask you to forgive me before I even know what I did, but I know you're going to show me. I know you're going to fix it. I plead the blood over it. Thank you for grace that makes wrong things right. Hallelujah. God's promises are his words released with his mighty power to create and change things. God's promises are his words. You remember, for instance, God said, let there be light. And it was. He said 11 things in Genesis 1, and every one of them came to pass right when he said it. Everything was his. And he gave it all to Adam. And he gave Adam the, the responsibility, the authority, and the privilege to speak words. Adam named all the animals. What he did was he called them by their name, and they were. God created everything. I believe he even formed the animal, formed a lion. And then his man, he'd turned the place over to, said, Lion B. What a, what a marvelous, uh, spectacular, Glorious would be a better word. Glorious way to live. was It was in the Garden of Eden before they messed it up. Well, God's never changed his mind on how he wants man to operate in this planet. It just took him 4,000 years to undo what Adam did and get that authority back to the human being so that we could start calling things again so that we could take God's promises and put them into motion by calling it, by declaring it, saying it. What a privilege. His prom so God's promises are his words. And they're released with his mighty power to create. That's the anointing. And to change things. His words already have the anointing in them to bring them to pass. The only thing left is for a human to agree with them and put the anointing in, that God's put in them in the word God already anointed and trigger the power in it so that it can bring it, so that word can come to pass. When you, when you pray for somebody, you don't need to know everything. You know, and, and it's okay. I mean, sometimes to, to, to call the thing that's wrong by the name, it's, it's okay. But there's a lot of ways to do this. Listen to your heart. Many, many, many times, I, uh, the, the prayer can be this simple. Sickness and disease, I take authority over you. You're evicted out of this body 
because by his stripes this body was healed and in the name of Jesus you're evicted now glory to God what you do just took the promise of God believed it in your heart God already said by his stripes are healed you mix your faith that he gave you with the faith he already put in his word and you deliver it with faith in the name of Jesus that every, every, name, every knee will bow to the name of Jesus. Every sickness, every disease, anything that's in the curse will bow its knee to the name of Jesus and he gave you the name to use. Amen. So you believe in your heart and say with your mouth of a simple directive in the name of Jesus, believe in God, that you just released the anointing, the anointed promise will bring itself to pass. God already said it, so it already will. When I say it again, I agree with it, and it's, a, it's yes, amen, so be it. Don't pick it back up. Don't wonder if it worked or not. Now, you can't stop the wonder in your head, but you can sure keep it from staying in there. Every time you have a, every time you have a thought in your head that's going contrary to what God promised, you need to get it out of there before you say it. If you say it, you've taken it, and you've just wrecked your prayer. And if you leave it floating around in your head long enough, you're going to say it. So get it out of there. Amen. Say, well, you know, that person's kind of old and they've, got, they've been smoking and they've been drinking and, you know, they probably... <laughs> How many of you know that God can heal somebody that's been smoking and drinking just as easily as he can heal somebody that's been eating vegetables and nothing else? They need help too. <laughs> Can't believe I said that. Uh, God can heal anybody or uh, from anything all the time. Why? The Bible said God can do anything. And he said, all things are possible to he that believeth God. So what happens when we get to go to pray for somebody and those thoughts start running around in our head? We can either take them captive, which means kick them, get them out of there, or not, and wind up having it hurt our faith. We'll say something like, you know, you need to quit smoking them cigarettes and God will heal you. How many of you have heard that before? What's that got to do with it? He's got lung cancer. If you quit, if you quit smoking him cigarettes, God will heal you. No, God will heal him. But he sure does need to quit smoking him cigarettes or he'll put her right back in there again. But you can't mix, you don't know mix this together trying to get somebody to do what you think they should be doing. Just show them how good God is. This is about God, that split second when that person is about to see just how big and how good almighty yeah. God is. And then, and then the devil's trying to get us to throw a little law and a few rules in there. Straighten that. Good time to straighten them out right there. I just looked at the clock. I probably need to stop for a I'll do one more. Believe. When I believe, say and do what God says and promised, that promise will come to pass every time. I guess that's a kind of a summary of the message tonight. I... Uh, I'm going to read uh, I'm going to read this and then we'll, I'll pray.
if you be willing and obedient, you shall eat the good of the land. You shall. Willing and obedient to do what? This Old Testament, I'm reading Isaiah 119. The blot of Isaiah was written by an Old Testament prophet to the church that would come hundreds of years later. And the, most of what he said, even if he wrote it to the people of that day, most of the Old Testament, you can switch from promises through the law to promises through grace just by changing the word law to grace. But this is a spiritual truth right here. If you're willing and obedient, two things. You gotta be willing to do it the way God said to do it. And then you have to be obedient to just go ahead and do it. And if you are willing and obedient, you shall eat the good of the land. God's not holding out on anybody is the point. Well, I know it works for some people and I also know it doesn't work for other people and I'm on one of them people that just doesn't seem to work. No, if you're willing and obedient, it'll work. Well, then I must not be willing and obedient. Well, then ask him. He lives on the inside of you. Say, where am I missing it? He'll tell you. And if, you know, if it sound, comes out like this and do something about it, it's your big fat mouth. Oh. I mean, I'm not saying that's what it is. I'm just saying it might be. There'll be something. There's something blocking the blessing because God gave the blessing for us to walk in. If it's not working, there's something in the way because God wants it to work. He gave it to work. He doesn't give, he doesn't give part of it to one person, part of it. He gave it all to everybody. Now, because of our limited personality traits and one thing or another, most of us are only going to walk in part of it, but it's not because God held out on anything. It's got to be developed. Growing it every day. Father, I thank you in the name of Jesus for uh, your promises. I thank you that you've given us everything it takes to live in victory and triumph every single time over any kind of opposition that comes our way. You said trouble's coming, and we've seen some of it. And we thank you for the promises that take us through and cause us to triumph every single time. And I thank you for these days ahead where we'll live in the supernatural glory of Almighty God right in front of anything getting dark. We're shining the light, turning it right. In Jesus' name, amen.